In You More Than Yourself by Slavoj Žižek, read by Philip von Gönitzer. In so far as the sin form is a certain signifier which is not enchained in a network but immediately filled, penetrated with enjoyment, its status is by definition psychosomatic, that of a terrifying bodily mark which is merely a mute attestation bearing witness to a disgusting enjoyment without representing anything or anyone. Is not Franz Kafka's story a country doctor, therefore the story of a synthom in its pure distilled, so to speak, form? The open wound growing luxuriously on the child's body this nauseous, verminous apparatur. What is it if not the embodiment of vitality as such, of the life substance in its most radical dimension of meaningless enjoyment? In his right side, near the hip, was an open wound as big as the palm of my hand, rose red, in many variations of shade, dark in the grooves lighter at the edges, softly granulating with irregular clots of blood, open as a surface mine to the daylight. That was how it looked from a distance. But on a closer inspection there was another complication. I could not help a low whistle of surprise, warmth, as thick and as long as my little finger, themselves rose red and blood spotted as well, were wiggling from their fastness in the interior of the wound towards the light, with small white heads and many little legs. Poor young man, he was past helping. I had discovered his great wound. This blossom in his side was destroying him. In his right side near the hips, exactly like Christ's wound, although its closest forerunner is the suffering of Amfortas in Wagner's Parsifal. Amfortas' problem is that as long as his wound bleeds, he cannot die, he cannot find peace in death. His attendants insist that he must do his duty and perform the grail's ritual regardless of his suffering, while he desperately asks them to have mercy on him and put an end to his suffering by simply killing him, exactly like the child in A Country Doctor, who addresses the narrator doctor with the desperate request, Doctor, let me die. At first sight, Wagner and Kafka are as far apart as they can be. On one hand, we have the late romantic revival of a medieval legend, on the other, the description of the fate of the individual in contemporary totalitarian bureaucracy. But if we look closer, we perceive that the fundamental problem of Parsifal is eminently a bureaucratic one. The incapacity, the incompetence of Amphotas in performing his ritual bureaucratic duty. The terrifying voice of Amphotas' father, Titorel, this superego injunction of the living dead, addresses his impotent son in the first act with the words, Mein Sohn Amphotas, bist du am Amt? to which we have to give all bureaucratic weight. Are you at your post? Are you ready to officiate? In a somewhat perfunctory sociological manner, we could say that Wagner's Parsifal is staging the historical fact that the classical master Amphotas is no longer capable of reigning 
in the conditions of totalitarian bureaucracy and that he must be replaced by a new figure of a leader, Parsifal. In his film version of Parsifal, Hans-Jürgen Süberberg demonstrated by a series of changes to Wagner's original that he was well aware of this fact. First, there is his manipulation of the sexual difference. At the crucial moment of inversion in the second act, after Kundri's kiss, Parsifal changes his sex. The male actor is replaced by a young, cold female. What is at stake here is no ideology of hermaphroditism, but a shred inside into the feminine nature of totalitarian power. Totalitarian law is an obscene law, penetrated by enjoyment, a law which has lost its formal neutrality. But what is crucial for us here is another feature of Sieberberg's version. The fact that he has externalized Amforta's wound. It is carried on a pillow beside him as a nauseous partial object out of which through an aperture resembling vaginal lips trickles blood. Here we have the contiguity with Kafka. It is as if the child's wound from a country doctor has externalized itself, becoming a separate object, gaining independent existence or, to use Lacan's style, existence. That is why Sieberberg stages the scene where, just before the final denouement, Amfortas desperately begs his attendants to run their sword through his body and so relieve him of his unbearable torments, in a way which differs radically from the customary way. Already I feel the darkness of death enshroud me. And must I yet again return to life? Madam, who would force me to live? Could you but grant me death? He tears open his jarment. Here I am. Here is the open wound. Here flows my blood that poisons me. Draw your weapon. Plunge your swords in deep, deep, up to the hilt. The wound is Amphotas' symptom. It embodies his filthy, nauseous enjoyment. It is his thickened condensed life substance, which does not let him die. His words, here I am, here is the open wound, are thus to be taken literally. All his being is in this wound. If we annihilate it, he himself will lose his positive ontological consistency and cease to exist. This scene is usually staged in accordance with Wagner's instructions. Amfotas tears open his charmant and points at the bleeding wound on his body, with Sieberberg who has internalized the wound. Amfotas points at the nauseous partial object outside himself, that is, he does not point back at himself, but there outside in the sense of there outside I am, in that disgusting piece of the real consists all my substance. How should we read this externality? The first most obvious solution is to conceive this wound as a symbolic one. The wound is externalized to show that it does not concern the body as such, but the symbolic network into which the body is caught. To put it simply, the real reason of Amphotas' impotence and therewith for the decay of his kingdom is a certain blockage, a certain snag in the network of symbolic relations. Something is rotten in this country where the ruler has trespassed a fundamental prohibition. He allowed himself 
to be seduced by Kunri. The wound is then just a materialization of a moral symbolic decay. But there is another, perhaps more radical reading, in so far as it sticks out from the symbolic and symbolized reality of the body, the wound is a little piece of real, a disgusting protuberance which cannot be integrated into the totality of our own body, a materialization of that which is in Amphotas more than Amphotas, and is thereby, according to the classic Lacanian formula, destroying him. It is destroying him, but at the same time it is the only thing which gives him consistency. This is the paradox of the psychoanalytic concept of the symptom. Symptom is an element clinching on like a kind of parasite and spoiling the game. But if we annihilate it, things get even worse. We lose all we had, even the rest which was threatened but not yet destroyed by the symptom. Confronted with the symptom, we are always in a position of an impossible choice, illustrated by a well-known joke about the chief editor of one of Hearst's newspapers. In spite of, in spite of persuasion from Hearst, he did not want to take well-deserved leave. When Hearst asked him why he did not want to go on his holidays, the editor's answer was, I am afraid that if I were absent for a couple of weeks, the sales of the newspaper would fall, but I am even more afraid that in spite of my absence, the sales would not fall. This is the symptom, an element which causes a great deal of trouble, but its absence would mean even greater trouble, total catastrophe. To take as a final example Ridley Scott's film Alien is not the disgusting parasite which jumps out of the body of poor John Hurt precisely such a symptom? Is not its status precisely the same as that of Amphata's externalized wound? The cave on the desert planet into which the space travelers enter when the computer registers signs of life in it and where the polyp-like parasite sticks on to Hertz's face has the status of the pre-symbolic thing that is of the maternal body of the living substance of enjoyment. The utero-vaginal associations aroused by this cave are almost too intrusive. The parasite adhering to Hertz's face is thus a kind of a sprout of enjoyment, a leftover of the maternal thing which then functions as a symptom, the real of enjoyment, of the group marooned in the wandering spaceship. It threatens them and at the same time constitutes them as a closed group. The fact that this parasitical object insistently changes its form merely confirms its anamorphic status. It is a pure being of semblance, the alien, the eighth supplementary passenger, is an object which, being nothing at all in itself, must nonetheless be added, annexed as an anamorphic surplus. It is the real at its purest a semblance, something which, on a strictly symbolic level, does not exist at all, but at the same time the only thing in the whole film which actually exists, the thing against which the whole reality is utterly defenseless. One has only to remember the spine-chilling scene when the liquid pouring from the polyblack parasite after the doctor makes an incision with a scalp dissolves the metal floor of the spaceship. From this perspective of sin form, truth and enjoyment are radically incompatible. The dimension of truth is opened through our misrecognition of the traumatic thing embodying the impossible chinois.